Um, so everyone, tonight's speaker is Bruce McRae, and we are fortunate to be able to call Bruce one of our own at the museum. Not only is he currently an active member within OMA, but he's also a contributing member of the Aurelia Historical Society and the Simcoe County Historical Association. And it's no wonder that Bruce is interested in history. His family roots run deep in this area, including a Scottish ancestor who was born in 1761 and later buried in Oro, and another Scottish ancestor who served under General Wolfe at the taking of Quebec in 1759. Bruce has had an impressive impact on local history, and we're very pleased to be able to have him joining us tonight. So without any more jibber jabber from me, I'm handing it over to Bruce McRae. Take it away, Bruce. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm very pleased to be here this evening. As, uh, as Lindy's indicated, my name is Bruce McRae. I'd like to welcome everyone to my somewhat solitary hobby of discovering World War I memorials. As a point of clarity, the, the commonly used term World War I did not exist until there was a World War II. As the Great War is cited on the names of these memorials in reference to 1914-1918, I'll be also using this more period authentic name. Some of Canada's most notable examples of Great War specific statuary can be found in the towns and small cities within a few hours radius of our homes in Aurelia. Following a few introductory slides, I'll be introducing works as arranged by sculptors. Tonight's presentation is entitled, The Sculptors of Great War Statuary in Central Ontario and Beyond. Pensive, somber, sorrowful, are emotions conveyed in the statue known as Tommy in Greatcoat. Designed by Emmanuel Hahn and exec exec sorry, executed by the Thompson Monument Company, this sculpture requires no allegorical interpretation of the soldier's seemingly thoughtful manner. In 1923, when it was unveiled in commemoration to the fallen of the town of Lindsay. Facing their Carnegie Library and at an oblique angle to their armories towards their rear is the listing entitled, Our Dead. In addition to the soldiers, there's one additional name, that being Lindsay's Sir Sam. They're often controversial member of parliament and former minister of the militia and defense. Sam Hughes suggested that the federal government should provide communities with war, memorial, war memorials identical in every respect except their size. With such outstanding examples of great war statuary available for us to discover, thankfully his idea of standardization went nowhere. The image on the left is the Wellen Crowland War Memorial by the William-born Elizabeth Winifred Wood. It was unveiled in Welland on September 3, 1939. The image on the right is an advertisement of the Thompson Monument Company of Toronto, of which Hahn was the chief designer. This design was selected for the Hermosa Township War Memorial, situated northwest of Welland, and as unveiled on September 1, 1919. With Wood sculpture being the last municipal memorial of the Great War to be unveiled, and Hans' design being the first, their works are like bookends on this 20-year span. The free-spirited Wood was the well-established Hans' student, who later became his wife. Stylistically, they differed widely. Their daughter, who many of us knew personally, likened her parents to Maggie and Pierre. Jennifer Wood Pond Brown was a dear colleague to many at OMA. As a leaping deer sculpture in Aurelius Victoria Park, or the Warhouse Bronze is visible from the sidewalk of either West or Tecumseh Street along the Brown property residence, one can surmise which was sculpted by the so-called Maggie or Pierre. The top right photo supplied by Sylvie Brown, a granddaughter of Wood and Hahn, shows a rare signature of her grandfather, which I will get to. I'd like to thank members of the Brown family for their assistance and for their attendance this evening. It was both impressive and humbling to learn of the prominent artists of which Jennifer was acquainted as, prim as primarily friends to her parents. The video that will conclude my presentation is certainly evidence of such friendship with the great Walter Seymour Hahn. I'm oh, sorry, Walter Seymour Alward, excuse me. From 1908 to 1912, Hahn was a studio, studio assistant to Allward 
in creating the towering South African Memorial on Toronto's University Avenue. In what we now know as the Boer War, which lasted from 1899 to 1902, 7,000 Canadians would enlist to serve Queen and Empire, with the loss of 260 Canadians, along with 250 wounded. The Great War commenced only a dozen years after the South African War, was obviously vast by comparison. The author Tim Cook wrote of the First War, quote, Grief from deaths overseas pervaded Canada. There were few families that did not experience loss directly or indirectly. Canada was a young country without familiarity with widespread bereavement or memorialization. The angel-like figure, the tall granite column, or Mother Britain seated in the center pointing the way would not be common features of great war memorials. However, the rank and file soldiers, similar to those shown here, would certainly be the mainstay of great war commemorative statues. From 1910 onwards, the tree-lined streets of Toronto's University Avenue would be replaced by buildings with bold architecture and statuary, often by the artists I will be mentioning for these war-themed memorials. In looking north, with Queen's Park faintly visible at the end of the road, this monument shown here would be dwarfed as if on a canyon floor, much like the Great War would dwarf the Boer War. Strictly in a numerical co comparison from South African War to the Great War, for each man enlisted in the South African War, 90 would enlist in the Great War. For each who died in South Africa, Canadian communities would collectively have 230 to commemorate. As I segue to Aurelius post-war commemorations, with 177,000 wounded in the Great War, Canadian communities would collectively face a 650-fold increase between these wars in recovered or recovering veterans returning home. Apart from this presentation being to members of the Aurelia Historical, the Aurelia Museum of Art and History, I, I would likely not be making reference to Aurelia in this presentation specifically on Great War themed statuary. As this, as this is a community that I have great affection for, I would like to take a minute to offer some ways that we differ from our peer communities. In 1921, the town of was the most populous community in Simpson County, with a population of 8,774 residents. It really was, in my mind, however, exemplary in some ways. Through care for the well-being of troops overseas to the YMCA and through entertainment by the dumbbells. Through care for the families of the fallen, with the really patriotic fund being the only municipally administered fund in Canada. And through the bricks and mortar project of the hospital as a memorial to the 163 Aurelia soldiers, primarily of the town of Aurelia and the township of Aurelia, whose names are inscribed in brass on the walls of the hospital chapel. And most especially through the ongoing care through volunteer medical services for veterans over three decades up until the introduction of OHIP. Our cenotaph inscribed with the words, lest we forget, was, a gratefully, was gratefully installed 50 years after it really decided upon a hospital in place of a war, a war memorial statue, such as those to be featured. However, although not Great War specific. In 1925, Aurelia did unveil the long, largest bronze statuary in the nation. Across Canada, commemorations by plaques, obelisks, cairns, artillery pieces, church windows, parks, buildings, and several other forms numbered in the multiple thousands. The total number of stone statues alone across Canada is roughly 400. Nationwide, there are only about 80 bronzes. They were expensive. Of that, 80, provinces, regiments, corporations, schools, fraternities would take a portion. As such, municipal bronzes numbered only a few dozen. Respectfully, the town of Wingham and others I will feature would not likely have ranked in that top two dozen in terms of population or presumably in collective wealth. The rusty appearance of this, of this uh, cenotaph in Wingham may be evidence of a cheaper metallurgical recipe for the bronze supply. When this monument does speak highly of the memorial committee, especially given it was unveiled by General Curry, famed for the successful capture of Vimy Ridge, General Curry gave a moving speech justifying the sacrifice 
of so many lives in the hope that, quote, war would be no more, unquote. Charles Addison, the sculptor, was born in Dundee, Scotland in the year 1880. By profession, he was a newspaper man. Married with six children, he signed his attestation papers at age 37. Unlike most artists, Charles Adamson served in the muddy trenches of the Western Front. His work is considered by some to have a higher degree of authenticity. In the book, Remembered in Bronze and Stone, author Alan McLeod wrote of Adamson's soldier as, quote, he has the look of one who has seen much and is grimly determined to do his duty. End quote. There's, no, there, there's nothing that glorifies war in Addison's sculpture. Commemorating, commemorating the 225 fallen of the Toronto District's Sons of England Benefit Society, it is the first memorial one passes on Toronto's university avenue. Unlike smaller centers with a single municipal cenotaph, this would be one of the many memorials created in Toronto. McLeod also wrote of this figure being a true likeness of a veteran of the trenches, like the men that Adamson had seen going to the front. Adamson would later create some of the sculptures adorning the exterior walls of the Whitney, of the Whitney building immediately east of Queen's Park. As the next slide will show, rarely are monuments as clearly labeled as the town of Collingwood's the last post designed by Charles McDonald. 1894-1963, a native son. Collingwood, the town with the population 1921 of 5,882, created a bronze custom. It features a statue of a bugler that has an art an heartwarming origin as it is a tale of two brothers, one the artist and architect behind the statue and the other the inspiration. The image on the left shows one of the otherwise identical attestation papers dated September 22, 1914, both being signed in Valcarce, Quebec, the staging area hurriedly built at the direction of the Minister of War, Sam Hughes. At seven weeks into the war, these two brothers were amongst the first 28,000, what would ultimately grow to 612,000 enlisted men. Soon the McDonald's will be under the training command of Major General Sam Steele, Later, the Sir Sam claimed by Aurelians. Both were injured at Langemark, better known as the Second Battle of Eve, and for the horrible experience caused by the first use of gas. Both were taken prisoner. Fred, the model for the sculpture depicted here, escaped and later returned to battle. This casting of Fred MacDonald by Charles MacDonald shows how they, do, how they chose to commemorate the fallen friend that they personally served with. Three towns, each over an hour's drive west or southwest of Aurelia, have bronzes by unknown sculptors. Orangeville, with a population in 1921 of 2,187, was likely typical of the population of the others being Shelburne and Meaford. After much consternation about building a hospital, a gymnasium, or a 70 foot foot, 74 foot tall obelisk, the community ultimately decided upon this statue. Newspaper clippings from that time expressed concerns that especially with the building, the association for the soldiers being memorialized would be lost over time. The statue they chose, presumably an available design of a memorial company, was comparatively celebratory in appearance. Both Orangeville and Meaford selected other non-static displays with bronze soldiers, both posed as throwing grenades. The two statues differ only slightly. Meaford also had an arduous time with their choice. Although also contemplating a hospital, only three communities in Canada would bring one to fruition, that being, one being Aurelia. The bronze list of names shown is one of two lists on display in Meaford, one strictly for the town, and the other was St. Vincent Township, who jointly funded this memorial. The war may have lasted 52 months, but the debate over commemoration choice took 55. In the town of Dundas, 
Aurelians would see a familiar sight. And like Aurelia, they have a canon identical to ours. But in a region that feels simply older with its War of 1812 monuments, even their canon cast in 1779 is older than ours. Dundas is a short distance west of downtown Hamilton. Hamilton is also the first name of this sculptor being presented. Born in England in 1846, Hamilton McCarthy's parents were artists. Trained as a sculptor by his father, schooled in Antwerp, he would be among the early masters of bronze sculpture in Canada after arriving in Toronto in 1885 at age 39. Some of McCarthy's other works include the Champlain Monument at Nepean Point, Ottawa, Sir John E. Macdonald at Queen's Park, and others from the South African War. Dundas's Social Memorial Monument is uncommon as it records both the fall of the South African War and the Great War, numbering two and 60 respectively. One of Hamilton McCarthy's 15 children would go on to become a prominent sculptor. That son has a unique first name of Cour de Lyon, part of a line. Cour de Lyon McCarthy was born in London in 1881 and grew up in Toronto. He received his training as a sculptor in his father's studio. He created numerous commemorative monuments. He died in Montreal in 1971. In Niagara Falls, Queen's Victoria Park, just past the arcades and tourist attractions on Clifton Hill, one will find the Niagara Falls Great War Memorial as created by Cour de Lyon. It features a soldier holding his helmet and confidently looking forward. The town of, the town of Godridge, along, along Ontario's Lake Huron shoreline, has an attractive statue also by this younger McCarthy. That is a photo on the right. It was erected in 1924 by the Canoe Club and the citizens of Goderidge. The signature on both these statues reads, Cour de Lyon McCarthy, with Montreal cited as his place of residence. Although Quebec's trois Rivières and Canada Pacific Railway's Windsor Station in Montreal are outside of the radius, I would suggest for a car ride to explore memorials. Other examples by the younger McCarthy are worth noting. As, Alan, as, Al, sorry, as, Arthur, as, sorry, as author Alan McLeod has observed, McCarthy's war memorial figures exhibit an, an emotional range probably unmatched among Canada's war memorial sculptures. To the left, the determined infantryman at Trois Rivières is apparently about to plunge his bayonet into the viewer below. To the right is one of three copies of CPR's elegant angel bearing a peaceful fallen soldier to heaven. Born in Shipton of Quebec's Eastern Townships in 1861, George W. Hill was a prolific designer of Canadian war memorials in the decade following the 1918 armistice. Although more commonly found in Eastern Canada, it is said that Hill's designs outnumber those of any other memorial sculptor at work in the aftermath of the War of 1914-1918. Known affectionately as Our Soldier, this statue is located at Harbord College Institute, a public secondary school located in downtown Toronto. Although named simply the soldier, it honors, quote, those former pupils who died for humanity in the Great War of 1914-1918, unquote. The year 1919 is sometimes used as it was the final year of deployment for many soldiers. Harbord sent over 500 students and staff, with 75 being lost. George W. Hill's monument at Charlottetown depicts three soldiers walking confidently forward, meant to represent those highly regarded Canadian soldiers known as the shock troops. The Sherbrooke War Memorial in Quebec's eastern townships was one I passed frequently while headed to the campus of Bishop University in nearby Lennoxville. The monument represents an angel with outspread wings, known as the goddess of victory, flying over three soldiers as they look upwards from a trench. Only one sculptor in the great in the post-Great War era would have more figures in their statues than the three and four depicted here by George Hill. Please excuse this grainy photo. Vernon Marsh's statues not only featured numerous figures, his bronzes were also very large. 
Although his first design was not specific to the Great War, when, when it was unveiled, it tied at seven with the, Bron with the Joseph Grant Memorial in terms of the number of bronzes, but was considered largest due to the physical size of the figures. Only one bronze, only one bronze, only one bronze statue in Canada ever would be larger. This photo shows Vernon March to the right and his brother Sidney as they stand beside the, the leg of the largest of the seven bronzes. At only 21 years of age, Vernon March submitted and was awarded the commission from Aurelius Champlain Monument Committee. Vernon's only other two major works that he would live to see unveiled were in Ireland and South Africa. In belonging to a family of sculptors, his six brothers and one sister would continue in completing his greatest achievement, the National War Memorial in Ottawa. Canada's National War Memorial, as designed by Vernon Marsh, is named the response, and it is located, of course, in our nation's capital. These photos will similarly show the scale of these marvelous bronze figures. Obviously, these men appear tiny next to the bronze angels or horses. Due to the sheer scale of this monument, few are likely aware of the exquisite detail of the horses or the soldiers mounted on their backs. As one will see in the next slide, the horses are seemingly lost in this complete monument. And please excuse me because I'm having a technical problem with this slide. March's theme was the great response of Canada. It represented uniform figures passing through the arch. March wrote, the idea was to perpetuate in this bronze group the people of Canada who went overseas to the Great War and to represent them as we, as, as we of today saw them as a record for future generations. At the unveiling, His Majesty George VI addressed an estimated 100,000 persons who, who gathered to witness the ceremony. King George spoke of the symbolism of the memorial and of sacrifice. The response was designed for one to see at a glance the answer made by Canada when the world's peace was broken and freedom threatened in the fateful years of the Great War. It intentionally depicts the zeal with which this country entered the conflict. Unlike the National War Memorial, depicting the camaraderie of soldiers together going off to war, I'll start with the works of Emmanuel Hahn with this work nicknamed Going Over the Top. Born in Germany in 1881, Emmanuel Hahn moved with his family to Canada at age seven. He studied art and design in Ontario and Stuttgart. He, he then went on to a distinguished career as a sculptor, starting with Toronto's Macintosh Marble and Granite Company in 1901. In 1906, he began working on contract with the Thompson Monument Company, a 40-year professional relationship which saw him become the chief designer. Going over the top is a monument that can be found in St. Lambert, a suburb of Montreal. It portrays the stomach-turning emptiness soldiers would feel at the terrible moment of starting the dash across no man's land. The original idea for this design was, sorry, the original design was in Summerside PEI, where General Curry would first see it. That retired general then decided to underwrite the cost of building this war memorial and chose this work by Hong. The Briefing Soldier design was the most popular of Hong's designs, with bronze and granite copies as far as distant as Westville, Nova, Nova Scotia, and Fernie, British Columbia. The closest example can be found in Bolton, Ontario. Upon the cross on, upon which the, the, sho, the, the sol, soldier is resting, his hand, is inscribed the title of the famous but somewhat foreboding poem by John McCrae, entitled New Flanders Fields. Veterans Park in Aurelia features the bronze plaques from 1920, listing the initial count of the town of Aurelia's 102 fallen. In its top left corner, one will find the first two names of the brothers with the surname Glover. On, on almost any Canadian World War I plaque, 
with names listed chronologically, one will find the first listed being those who died in the Second Battle of Ypres, the battle which inspired the prayer. Throughout your lives, you have carried samples of Hans' works in your pockets and wallets. The blue nose schooner dime, the caribou quarter, were his designs, and to Canadians, they become among the more recognizable assembles. With Hans being, Han being German born, it was, not, it was not beyond salesmen making sales pitches to memorials committees to use Hans' nationality at birth specifically against him or his, or his design submissions. Neither was it beyond competitors to create their own versions of Han inspired options. Three such examples to the right can be found in the village of Priceville in Gray County, Port Dalhousie, the community now in St. Catharines, and to the far right, our neighbors in Barrie. The recent photo shows that city's wonderful civic improvements with their Seneca featured prominently. During my opening two slides featuring Lindsay's Ontario's Tommy and Greatcoat, I mentioned that Emmanuel Hong was our late friend, Kenneth Brown's father. She had commented that her father would have been a member of the group of seven if that group had included sculptures. Emmanuel Hahn was certainly of that caliber and stature among Canada's great artists. Stylistically, I personally offer the, that same accolade to Kennifer's mother, Elizabeth Winifred Wood. She was born at the family cottage on Aurelia Cedar Island in 1903. She studied at the Ontario College of Art under two members of the group of seven artists who were famous for the flowing lines and dramatic landscapes. Her instructors were J.E.H. McDonald and Arthur Lisner. The Wellen Crowland War Memorial, designed by Elizabeth Winwood, with Winwood being more of a professional name, features two heroic figures, man the defender and woman the giver, a set against a modernistic interpretation of the Canadian landscape with red pine and white wheat sheen, also with the representation of a World War I French mortar. On the base is written, service and sacrifice, referencing the soldiers who had served overseas and sacrifice of Canadians' burden on the home front. The latter was rarely considered in Great War commemorative statues. I mentioned before the unveiling was on September 1939. Three days prior to the unveiling, Germany had declared war with the invasion of Poland. One day prior, Britain had declared war and Canadian Parliament was called into special session. How poignant the theme of service and sacrifice that would have been at that moment of unveiling uh, with Canadian declaration of war being imminent. Frances Loring was born in Idaho in 1887. Her father was a mining engineer. She studied at multiple art colleges or schools in Switzerland, Paris, Chicago, Boston, and New York before moving to Canada in 1913. Frances Loring described her memorial forming the gold cenotaph as, quote, out of a large central stone merges the heroic male figure. Um, and on the opposite side is um, it's a female figure representing peace. Sorry for that. Looks up. At the base of the memorial by Frances Loring at Toronto's Osgood Hall, is carved part of the line from Rupert Brooks' War Sonnets, quote, these laid the world away, unquote. A glorious memorial to Ontario lawyers and law students killed in World War I stands on the east wall of the Great Library in Osgood Hall on Queen Street West at the corner of Uni University Avenue in Toronto. The statue is described out as an allegorical figure of a, a quote, a young man casting off the robes of daily life in the service of humanity, end quote. Many Canadians will have connections to names described in great war memorials somewhere. 
it is, a, it is on the wall behind the statue where I can find my personal connection to a family member lost in the Great War. Alfred Howell was known for his powerful sculptures in the First War, including the Oshawa War Memorial, known as the Garden of the Unforgotten. By any measure, this is an impressive monument for a community of 11,000 residents. The Garden of the Unforgotten includes this imposing soldier standing atop a central pillar flanked side-by-side -side panels with bronze and stone inserts. These stone inserts were supplied from 18 Allied countries, stone from Westminster Abbey, and stone from the battlefields, including each Yeek, Mons, Cambrai, Arras, Ashendale, and Reims. This legend further describes stones incorporated in the monument and including the Vinnie Ridge Stone, being selected from the battlefield by His Excellency, Excellency Lord Bing of Vinnie, Governor General of Canada. The United States of America has stone donated by ex President Woodrow Wilson from his native state of Virginia. There is also stone there from Belgium, from Newland University at Louvain, Japan, from a university ruined by earthquake from Egypt, from the inner temple of the Egyptian second pyramid. To the right is that, is that ruined university where the record of evolving thought was lost with 300,000 medieval books and manuscripts being, set, being deliberately set ablaze by the invading army. The time capsule enclosed in the basin to be opened in the year 2424 is evidence of the permanence intended for this statue by the memorial committee. Within the memorial, there's a replacement stone to replace the one to be broken when accessing the time capsule 500 years hence. In many cases, it was mid-sized mid communities that created some of the most interesting art. Wealth and the next few communities to follow had populations of approximately 20,000 one century ago. The Guelph Civic War Memorial is one of Howell, is one where Howell used allegory in his design to symbolize deeper meaning, deeper meanings. When approaching the Guelph Cenotaph from afar, one sees three figures. The middle figure being directed to look at what's presumably a book. The, the upper figure pointing at the book, presumably St. Peter, is, turn, is turned away, unable to bear looking at the book, presumably the list of the following. The bottom figure has arms outstretched in front of the cross, so as one so as one would assume it to be Jesus. Howell, how, however, just opposes Jesus and St. Peter with female forms. The female in Alfred Howell's triumph of right over God over the God of War is depicted even more powerfully. The Sault Ste. Marie Memorial is designed around a central bronze sculpture group that romantically depicts the god of war as the crouching naked male, under which was known as the shield of right. As is very uncommon, the German helmet beside him would denote his nationality. The shield of right is held beneath the foot of a female and at the tip of the sword that she is holding in her right hand. In her left hand, she is holding a sprig of maple leaves skyward. This power dynamic was progressive for a statue in the 1920s. I've heard some people refer to her looking more like, like, um, like Wonder Woman, for example, the, the shield and the, and the uh, sword. The final feature of this memorial somewhat mitigates the celebratory message of the bronze male and female figures. One of the two bronze panels one shows one shows shoulder, sh excuse me, uh, soldiers confidently heading off to war with the children giving a final hug to her father. The other panel shows men bedraggled, crippled, and one wounded carried on a stretcher on the return from the front. Walter Allward's life began modestly. His father was a carpenter in Newfoundland who moved his young family to Toronto in the 1880s. 
Presumably with tools he fashioned, the young Walter created shapes from the clay he took from the banks of the Don River. From library books and magazines, he learned of the works of his idols. In 1894, at age 19, Allward entered and won a competition to design a bronze statue for the grounds of the recently opened Ontario Legislature building. His statue of peace in commemoration of the Northwest Rebellion Monument would be the first of others at Queen's Park. The sheathed sword would be replaced by stylized versions of later works. Unlike his first statue, where the figure seemed seemingly gesturing silence, his later work would certainly be different. With an outstretched arm, with, with, with an outstretched left arm, like a traffic warden, the bronze figure representing civilization is clearly commanding stop. His sword is not sheathed. It is held in his right hand, and although not threatening, with its tip with its tip still on the ground, it is ready and available to enforce the command to the second figure to use to which he is facing. This dramatically arched figure, known as Strike, is the second of the two figures in Peterborough's Citizens War Memorial. It is a figure being commanded to stop. This soldier's right arm is covering his face in despair. His broken sword lays at his feet. The wings forming, forming on his back indicate that he is dying and presumably to ascend heavenwards. This photo shows the, the right side of stripes. Sorry, the photo on the right shows Strike's left side. Excuse me. His wings appear more developed from, from this angle. Although difficult to see, his left arm extends downwards, holding a lit torch upside down. With some digital lightening of the body in the background, the torch becomes more apparent. As with John McCrae's poem, the voice of the dead or dying says, Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. The proverbial passing of the torch is intended as a pledge to continue the battle. With the war now being over, and with this figure clearly gesturing stop, is he directing the man with the failing hands not to throw the torch in perpetuation of war? Walter Allward's Peterborough Citizens War Memorial is an astonishing work of art that all should see and all should ponder. The Stratford Sound Shop by Walter Allward is another thought provoking masterpiece that also symbolizes the triumph of the right over brute force. The inscription reads They gave their lives to break the power of the sword. 1914 to 1919. It features two male figures standing back to back, one representing hope and the other despair. Hope boldly looks upwards towards the heavens, his left hand holding a palm branch symbolizing peace. His back is towards the figure of despair. Despair looks tragically downwards with a cloth held by his right hand covering his head. His bare feet, sorry, his bare left hand holds the blade of a broken sword with his hilt being, being dragged repeatedly along the ground. It is a side image to view. The face of the figure representing despair pitifully shows pain and sorrow. This is a dramatically expressive work. By far, Alward's most famous work is a Vimeo Memorial, one that we will see in the images of a video to follow. After the video, there will be a Q&A. This video by Veterans Affairs is entitled The Sculptor's Tools. It happened to be the subject of one of my last communications with Benefit. I hope you enjoyed the video. So it's uh, Don Philip here, and I'm just going to switch now. I'm going to share my screen. There'll be a moment when you won't see too much because uh, I have to start things up. And then 
make it full screen. So I'm starting it now and you should be able to see it. I got them from Dr. Elizabeth Bradford Holbrook, but she said that she kept these tucked away and that she wanted me to have them. She would share with me the story about um, their age and the importance of that it can come from the hands of Walter Albert. She would pull the certain tools out and then she would say, you know, this would have probably been used for the detail here. So she was always giving me like these little lessons, which I always thought was great. Her decision for passing it on to me was somebody who was dedicated and somebody who was driven and somebody who, was, who I think had already proven to her that I wasn't uh, just a dreamer. I think that's what it would be for me as well. I've used them on lots of things. Um, uh, a lot on most of my busts and work. It's part of what was already written uh, in, the, when they were being made over a hundred years ago. I think it's important for people uh, worldwide to understand the role of the artist in the community and then how they're going to be laid out for people to see that the hand of this great mind actually used these tools for the concept to create this incredible monument that you know people flock around the world to go see. I'm returning this back to Bruce. Great, well done, Bruce. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's wonderful. I, I still have my conclusions. Okay. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get to control the screen once again. All right, it's back to you now, Bruce. I apologize for this glitch. Um, as you can read for yourself, <laughs> uh, regarding the sculpture tools that belong to Walter Allward, I can for not being aware of their receipt or the furtherance to other artists. She explained that following grade 13 that year, she and her friend were off exploring Europe. Her father passed away two years later. Hopefully, as I've gone through these slides, you'll be mapping a personal roadmap of discovery. In this age of social distancing, you will not, you, will, you need not be concerned of lineups of these great war memorials. For those watching this video, for those watching the video version of this presentation, readings, resources, and suggested websites are concluded at the end. Thank you. Are we back to you, Lindsay? Back to me. Okay. So Bruce, if you are willing, we're going to uh, open it up for questions now. And uh, folks, if you have any questions at all, please put them in the Q&A, which you should see down at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will pose them to Bruce and he, we will do our best to have them answered for you. Bruce, I actually just have a question for you. Um, yes. Of all of the statues that you talked about today, what is the most meaningful one to you personally? My favorite one to go visit is the, is the Walter Allward statue in Stratford. It is, it is almost painful to see the, the second figure, uh, the one that is that is uh, holding the, the sword by the by the blade and dragging it along. It is um, a very, very powerful, powerful um, symbol to my, in my mind. 
Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, Don, go ahead. We have a question from Jane Bonsteel in the chat space. Yes, we and do. Um, Jane says, uh, <laughs> I should have been taking notes. Is there a list of statues, artists, and locations? Yes, there will be. On the, um, after the video presentation, I will leave uh, websites to search and books to read as, as screens on, 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 the, um, on the presentation. So you'll be able to access them on, on the video. Great. Um, and Mark is wondering, are these listed on a website or included in a book? Uh, yes to both. Uh, Alan Livingstone is, is the uh, sorry Alan, Alan, Alan Livingstone McLeod has a book entitled Remembered in Bronze and Stone. Uh, Eric McGear has a book entitled Canada's Dream Shall Be of Them. Uh, there's a book called, uh, by jo Joanna McEwen regarding Emmanuel Hahn and Elizabeth Lynn Wood. Another by by Heather Robinson, The Terrible Beauty, and um, uh, there's a number of, cell, of websites which will, which will also be indicated. Uh, just a quick question about those books that you mentioned. Uh, since we have a number of people from Aurelia uh, listening in tonight, are they available at the Aurelia Public Library, do you know? I am not aware if they are there. I suspect they would be. And um, Space. We do, yes. Uh, we have a question uh, which reads, how do you feel public perception of these statues has changed from the time they were created to now? Great question. Yes, certainly. Certainly. Uh, the, when, they were, were, when they were erected, there were people that had personal links to the names engraved in stone. And over time, as those, those, as those linkages have, have, have faded away, there's, there's no longer the, the, the direct relation to, to the monuments. I feel that uh, as, as time has passed, the, the awareness of the population in general to the significance of the first war or the second has also waned over time. So unfortunately, I do believe that there's, there's a lessening appreciation of what these monuments represent. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, unfortunately that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, so um, uh, to wrap it up, I'm going to pass it over to Trish, who again is the head of the history committee for OMA. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, on behalf of OMA and the History Committee, I want to first of all thank Bruce for agreeing to be our guest speaker um, tonight and sharing with us your passion for the First World War Memorial Statuary um, across our country, um, like in our region, especially our region, and also the really connection with um, the Elizabeth Winwood and her um, family. Um, and personally, uh, you have given me some really food for thought on some pretty cool road trips this summer. We're kind of limited on our travel options, as we all know, uh, during this time. So definitely we'll be looking into those suggestions or reading materials to see how I can map out some routes because the statues you shared are just incredibly emotional and very powerful. And I think it's very important that, you know, we take family members and go check those out this summer. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank all those in attendance today uh, for your participation. As always, your support of the museum is very much appreciated and of the speaker series. Um, and if you aren't members already of the museum, you know, please feel free to come and join us at the museum. Um, any donations um, are always appreciated. Um, as we did last month, we're going to uh, be sending out a survey. Uh, for this evening. So even if you filled out a survey last month, please feel free to fill out one again for us to give us input on this particular presentation. And it will also be stored up in YouTube. So if you are thinking of planning out road trips, you might want to visit YouTube and check out the presentation and write things down. And I'm sure there might be some additional resources there we can make available for you. Um, we will be continuing our speaker series next month 
in June. So Wednesday, June 16th at 7 p.m., please mark your calendars. We are going to have Kathy Walton, um, who's from Springwater, just west of Barrie. And she wrote the book, Vanishing Barns, Remembering the Gentle Giants Through Photographs, Stories, Diaries, and Genealogy. So we invite you to join us uh, to share, where Kathy's gonna share the history, not only of the building of the barns and the structures themselves, but also the stories of the families who built them and, and used them uh, back in the day. So once again, thank you, Bruce, for a very enlightening presentation and for all of you in attendance, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. All right, uh, that's it for us tonight. We hope to see you all back here next month. Yeah. And uh, take care, everybody. All the best.